you're not making any meaningful progress, if at all. You have nothing to lose to try this and everything to gain. Now, the type of routine I'm giving you, there's, there are, there are no isolation exercises involved here. This pro, again, I could have given you a hundred more exercises and statics and negatives and rest pause, but as your trainer, in a sense, my job initially is to get you to start growing. We can throw in the heavy art. Try this for three months first. This is a, I call this a baseline program. If you start throwing in all these other, these tangentials, and you were to call me for a phone consultation, I wouldn't know how to assess your progress. So I always start people out on this bare bones startup baseline program. That from at least certain perspectives, this program is the perfect strength or bodybuilding training program. If you keep in mind, once again, that the ideal situation is to stimulate all the major muscles of the body with the least amount of exercise possible. Well, again, I'm not asking you to do the least amount possible, which is one set. The following routine, the program you're here listed, is at least from one perspective, the literal perfect bodybuilding program. If you keep in mind this one thing, that the ideal situation is to be able to stimulate all of the major muscles of the body with the least amount of exercise possible, which is one set. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do but one set. Uh, let me explain. Bearing in mind all the while that, as I stated earlier, to a volume number of sets is a negative factor period. Keep that in mind as you hear this. You will perform two different workouts referred to as workout A and workout B. You will do one workout a week. So if you start on a Saturday, for instance, it doesn't have to be a Saturday, with workout A, you wouldn't perform workout B until the next Saturday. And if a scheduling conflict arises, don't go back to the, the sixth day. Don't reduce the frequency. Go to the eighth day. And after eight or, to eight or so total workouts, take two full weeks off, then resume training once every nine days. And for the following reason. In fact, this is the most important issue in exercise science once you have first understood what you heard earlier, the fundamentals of intensity, volume, and frequency. After eight or so total workouts, take two weeks off, then resume training once every nine days for the following reason. You will grow stronger as a result of every workout without a doubt, unless you're extremely genetically hurting. You will grow stronger as a result of each workout. You will, in other words, audience, be lifting progressively heavier weights all the time. Do you see where it stands to reason, dear listeners, that as the weights grow progressively greater, then the stresses also grow progressively greater too? Does that make sense? If you don't do something to compensate, to compensate for the ever-growing stress, the stresses will reach a critical point such that they constitute overtraining. The first, of course, will be a slowdown in progress. And if you continue with the same exact volume and frequency protocol, there will ultimately be a complete cessation of progress known as a sticking point. This can be prevented by inserting extra rest days and taking layoffs. You should never have to reach a sticking point. All right, let's move to the workout. Workout A will consist of, number one, a set of squats, preferably on a Smith machine, 8 to 15 reps of failure. <clears throat> if you don't have a, a, a Smith machine, don't worry about it. Just do regular old-fashioned free weight squats. After that, take a brief rest. Get a drink of water. Let your breathing slow down. As soon as you clearly recognize you're ready to go, boom, you go to exercise number two, close grip, palms up, pull down for six to ten reps to failure. Now, by close grip, I mean your grip should be about eight inches apart, your hands. Palms up. This is palms up, not palms down, like a barbell curl grip. 
close grip, palms up, pull downs, six to ten reps to failure or thereabouts. By the way, when I say eight to fifteen for the squats or six to ten for the pull downs, that's not a magic range or number. If you remember, the important thing is going to failure. If you get to 15 reps on the squat and you see you have 18, don't stop at 15. Remember, the stimulus responsible for triggering growth is that last hard, almost impossible rep. <laughs> Be sure to initiate this movement, the pull down, with extreme deliberation. There should be no sudden jerking, yanking, or thrusting to get the weight started and to keep it moving. Not super slow, but relatively slow. Not 10 seconds up and 10 seconds down. In fact, the keynote here is there's no magic number of seconds. The keynote is control. You want to lift the weight under full muscular control, pause momentarily in the contracted position or for two to three seconds, and lower under control. I have, I have discovered recently through my own workouts that this usually translates into a four to four cadence, four seconds down, two seconds hold, and four seconds up. But if you're off by 0.4 seconds or 1.2, don't worry about it too much. And that is all for workout A, just two sets of one exercise. One week later, you'll perform workout B, which will consist of number one, a set of Regular, not stiff-legged or sumo, but regular old-fashioned power lifter deadlifts for five to eight reps of failure. Now, if there is one exercise I'd like to see you fall in love with, audience, it's this one. As the deadlift is properly regarded by most as the greatest overall strength and mass builder. After the deadlifts, take a, a brief one or two minute rest, then proceed to dips. Regular parallel bar dips, just like you did back in high school gym class. Do the dips, like the pull-downs, under full strict muscular control for 6 to 10 reps. If you can do more than 10 reps, as I rather suspect most of you can do, add weight. I meant to emphasize the dip. Think of the dip as the upper body squat. You cannot beat it. It is the best pec exercise in the world, the best shoulder and tricep exercise. If you don't have access to one or you can't do dips, try incline presses. And that's all for workout B. Now, I have no doubt what some of you are thinking. That's it, Spencer, that's all. you got to be fucking crazy. <laughs> well, remember, the goal is not to see how many sets you can mindlessly endure, but to intelligently, knowingly, rationally, logically do only what nature requires to activate the growth mechanism and no more. Yes, there are hundreds of exercises you could do, but where do you draw the line? Very often, tell a new phone consultation client to do this workout, he'll say, oh, but Mike, how about the leg curls for the hamstrings? No bent over dumbbell concentration curls like Arnold says for the lower outer 32nd of the bicep. How about seated calf raises for that special part of the calf? Or this for that, that for this, on and on ad infinitum. And I respond rather firmly, but sir, that's precisely what the hell you were doing before. That's what led you to call for my phone services, whether you realize it or not. Your problem, I continue, is that you so burned yourself out with all those sets trying to build in the detail. Why don't you build a 20-inch arm first? You see the point. Why is this program that I'm, I just gave you, from one perspective again, perfect? Well, let's look at the pull-downs. While most people think of them exclusively as a lat exercise, and they are very good for the lats, they are also very effective in working the and it just so happens to be true, audience, the close grip, palms up, pull down is the best bicep exercise in the world, better than any curl you can do. Here's why. <clears throat> when you do a curl, whether it's a barbell curl, a nautilus curl, a dumbbell curl, whatever, you're working this muscle around a single joint axis, the elbow, which is why the stress is limited exclusively to the lower bicep, if you've noticed. When doing a grip palms up pull down on the other hand you're working the bicep around the joint the elbow joint and the shoulder 
the muscle is contracting more uniformly from both ends. And the dips. Again, I said think of the dips as the upper body squat. Dips are by far, without a doubt, they're unparalleled. They are the best exercise for pecs, delts, and triceps. You will grow stronger each and every workout from the program listed, and larger too, but only if you are obtaining adequate nutrition. Keep in mind the guiding principle, get a well-balanced diet. A well-balanced diet consists of 60% carbohydrates, 25% protein, and 15% fats. All these other ratios you've been reading about lately come from not reputable nutritional scientists, but food fattists and nutritional mythologists. A 60-25 team is a well-balanced diet. You've heard of the four basic food groups. Cereals and grains, fruits and vegetables, meat, fish, poultry, milk. If you get your daily, con in fact, I just realized this six months ago, if you're getting a well-balanced diet, if you're obtaining your daily complement of the four basic food groups, you have a 60-25-15 ratio. Remember, muscle is not mostly protein, it's mostly water. Now look at the, look at the word carbohydrate. The suffix hydrate means water. As you probably all know, the carbohydrate stores in the muscle becomes a chain of sugar molecules called glycogen. And every gram of glycogen stored in the muscle chemically bonds with and holds three grams of water. When you go lower than 60% carbohydrates on a high intensity program, you're going to burn the glycogen out of the muscle, not restore it, and the water that was chemically bonded will leave the muscle too and the muscle becomes flat flaccid and dehydrated and if you stay on it long enough you'll actually go into muscle catabolism your muscle will actually break down go to the liver and through a very complicated process called gluconogenesis will turn your own body's protein into sugar so sugar ain't the bogeyman has been made out to be it should predominate in a well-balanced diet you can optimize you can, you can make your recovery ability optimum for your own genetics by eating an adequate, well-balanced diet, but you can't, by stuffing in supplements and huge quantities of food, make it super great. No. There is no such thing as super nutrition, only optimum nutrition. Your body can only utilize so much nutrients. Any excess will either be excreted or turned to fat. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video and the information provided, please check out more of my videos and subscribe to my channel. Train like Mike.